I've been in the Bay Area now for four years. Uh, I'm originally from the East Coast, and when I first moved here, I went back for a trip uh, to DC to see some of my college friends. And on the way to the airport for my flight back to San Francisco, my Uber driver and I randomly started talking about pool. My driver was talking about how he likes to play pool, how often he plays it, and I was telling him how I used to play it a lot in college too because I had a, a table in my freshman and sophomore year dorm and I didn't feel like getting my work done. So we kept talking and he eventually told me about the APA, which stands for the American Pool Players Association. And the APA is a national league where teams will play out of various bars in their respective cities. He basically said that teams were always for looking for new members and that different teams were made up of members with different skill levels and there was a handicap system in place. Basically trying to get across the point that it was set up for people to join no matter their level of experience. And since I was new to San Francisco, this was all really appealing to me. I didn't know many people in the city and I was just getting to know the Bay Area. And it occurred to me that when I landed and got home, I should sign up for this thing because I love to play pool and I was looking to make new friends and learn the city that I had just moved to. So here we are four years later. If you talk to my friends and my coworkers, they'll probably tell you that I'm obsessed. I'm on three teams here in the city in the league, and believe it or not, that number's actually gone up since the last time that I gave this talk. A couple of years ago, one of my teams and I, we went to Hawaii for a tournament. Uh, in April, I'm going to Vegas for my first national tournament, and I just had a pool table installed in my apartment. Actually, I was playing right before I got here because there's never a bad time to practice. My, my pool, not my talk. Well, both. <laughs> but I don't play pool all the time, and I'm certainly not a professional. By day, I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix. I've been there for two years now, working on our acquisition UI team, which is our team that focuses primarily on working on the sign-up funnel across multiple platforms. And for the majority of 2017, I spent my time re-architecting our sign-up flow. So today, I wanted to talk about what I learned from that experience because software re-architectures are hard and they're nebulous. To start, it's hard to know where to start working on them. And they can be overwhelming. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. You have to rewrite or rethink the way a whole code base works. And it's also hard because you need to figure out the code base's current problems, how to fix them and maintain the current feature set but also think about the new architecture and how it's going to support future feature development. And so software re-architectures can be described as a careful blend of strategy and execution. And up until now, I haven't come across a good mental framework for providing guidance on how to approach doing this. And that's where pool comes in for me, and maybe after this talk it might come in for you too. Because we can learn from pool. We can borrow the same tactics that go into playing a game to figure out how to blend strategy and execution when it comes to re-architecting software. So today we're going to talk about what I learned from re-architecting our sign-up flow last year. And I'm going to start with some context behind why we decided to do that in the first place. And then I want to walk you through playing a game of pool and the steps that are involved and how that applies to software engineering. And then I'm going to conclude. So as many of you probably already know, at Netflix we do a lot of A-B testing on our UIs. When we want to make an update, we generally have an idea of something we think that's going to be an improvement over what we currently have in the UI. We also generally have a hypothesis as to why we think it's going to be better. And for each idea, we might have several designs, several possibilities, and while as designers and engineers we like to think that we're infallible when it comes to picking the right one, we prefer to use data. So we'll A-B test all of our UI improvements. And now A-B testing is kind of misleading in this situation because we actually have multiple variants. We often run tests with more than two, so think of it more as A, B, C, D, and E testing. So we take our designs for the test, we'll implement them, and we'll start running our test in production. And when each variant has enough users experiencing that experience, or at least enough to make it significant, we'll pick the winning variant. So, some of you may have heard about the A-B test that we run on the member side, but in sign-up, when we A-B test something, our goals are slightly different than increasing the number of hours that our members are watching. On the acquisition side, we try to accomplish two things. 
The first is that we try to improve the rate at which people are signing up. And the second is to find more qualified members. We want the people that come through our service and sign up to stick around and keep their subscription for longer. So for the past two or three years, we've been rigorously testing our sign-up flow. And this is what our old sign-up flow used to look like. Our first step is that we ask the user to select the plan. We then ask them for an email and password to create their account. And lastly, we want a method of payment from them. And in between every page here, we have a full page reload. And so this is our new sign-up flow. Compared to our old one, the most obvious difference is that it's more Netflix branded, so we've got red instead of blue. This was done so that it's more in line visually with the member experience. We have the same steps as we had before, but on the engineering side, our new sign-up flow is now a single page application. So the A-B test that was designed for this new sign-up flow had many variants, and as you can imagine, that since I'm talking to you here today, one of those variants was very successful and outperformed our old design. And so we decided to go through a step at Netflix that we call productization, which is where we take the code that was written for our test and we make sure that it's production ready. We also make sure that we clean up all of the code rel related to the other variants of the test. The level of effort involved in this depends on the UI area and the scale of the test. In this particular case, when we decided to productize our sign-up test, we decided that we were going to rewrite the entire code base that was used for the test because of the scale of it and also because of the importance to sign up for our business. So you're probably wondering, why are we already rewriting our sign-up flow when we just rewrote it so we could test it? There's a couple reasons. When we A-B test things at Netflix, we don't often know how they're going to perform against our existing UI, and so we often make compromises on the quality and scalability of the implementation. And we do this so that we can get a quick understanding of how the new designs are going to perform against what we currently have, especially before we decide to invest a lot of resources into perfecting the code. So here, specifically, the compromises in code quali quality manifested in the way that we were dealing with our state and our business logic on the client side. So our UI components were written in React, but for the test, we had implemented a homegrown data management solution for our single page application. And we ended up with our state and business logic sort of all over the place. We had it at the top level of our application and we also had it kind of sprinkled throughout our component tree. And over time, this became really hard to maintain and it was very hard for others to follow the client side logic. It was also somewhat bug prone because as we were updating the test for fixes or we were adding new ideas to it, we would sometimes need to add more state and we wouldn't always add it in the same place that it had that it had been added before. So when we decided to productize our winning variant, like I said, we decided to rewrite it. We thought that this was the best course of action so that we can consolidate our state and manage it in one place in the application going forward. Especially since we already had ideas for future A-B tests that we were going to run on top of what was already tested. So we wanted to make sure that the code base was maintainable in the long run but also extensible enough to A-B test and experiment on top of in the future. So this is where I came in. To help productize our new sign-up experience and re-architect the code base that was, had been used for the A-B test. So re-architecting things is hard and this is often what I feel like when I work on them. <laughs> so not only is there a lot of work that you need to do in rewriting an entire code base, but as developers, we don't often document things really well especially when we're in the middle of testing something and we're working quickly. So how do you begin to navigate a code base that you don't understand without much documentation and figure out what the current features that are supported are? And to make things even more complicated, we also know that we want to rewrite it in a way that makes it easy to test on top of. This is really difficult when you have no idea what types of A-B tests you're going to run, but you're almost 100% certain that you're going to run them. So how do we think about re-architecting code so that it can be reliable and maintainable now and also extensible in the future? And here's where I want to bring pool in. So since I've moved to the city, in my time playing pool and coding, I've realized that they involve similar types of problem solving. In pool and in software engineering, there's often a clear end goal 
And in each step along the way, you need to not only deal with the immediate problems at hand, but also strategize about what your next step might be. You also need to be able to execute that next step so that you're well enough set up for the one that comes after. So back to pool. I like to summarize it as masterfully combining strategy and execution so that we set ourselves up for success in the long term. And I want to show you how this applies to re-architecting code as well. So let's just talk quickly about the steps that go into playing a game of pool. So you can break it down into five steps. The first is that you choose your lineup, after which you walk around the table, you find your way out, take your shot, and repeat. And I'm going to go through each step one at a time and directly follow each point up with how that applies to software engineering, and specifically the task of re-architecting code. So the first step is to choose your lineup. And like I mentioned, I'm in a league here in the city. The league is made up of teams. Five members of my team will go up against five members of another team on a given night in individual matchups. And everyone in the league is assigned a skill level. So on a typical league night, the first thing that we do is we want to try and choose our lineup as intelligently as we can. We want to choose five people to play out of our team of about eight or so people that are going to match up well against the members of the other team based on our strengths and weaknesses and their strengths and weaknesses. In software engineering, we also need to be thoughtful about picking our lineup correctly. So here, when I say that, I mean picking the right people and resources to work on a re-architecture that makes sense to the specific task at hand. Our opponent here is not another team, but it's the code base that we're working on. We need to pick our resources intelligently so that we can take advantage of the experience and the skill levels or skill sets of the members on our team to address the specific issues that we're trying to fix in our code base. In our case, our UI components were written in React, and we had a lot of states sprinkled throughout our component tree. Since our sign-up flow involves a lot of A-B testing, we not only knew that we needed to make this more maintainable, but we also wanted it to be scalable, flexible, and reusable enough to go through future experimentation. So, like I've mentioned before, this meant pulling the state out of our component tree and consolidating it somewhere else. So this is where I specifically come in. I love reusable UI components, and at my previous job, I spent a lot of time working on them and building them. In fact, I've even given a talk about it. So I was chosen as part of the lineup to work on this project to take some of that experience from my previous job and apply it here, especially with regards to being thoughtful about where state is stored in our components. Okay, so after we choose our lineup and pool the night and usually the fun begins. So I typically play eight ball in the league and without going into too much detail about the rules, just a quick overview, the goal of the game really is to get the eight ball in at the very end after you've already hit your balls in. Generally I'm playing an opponent so we'll take turns at the table and when someone misses or fouls our turn turns over to the other player. So when it's my turn, at the table, the first thing I'm going to do is walk around it. And I'm going to physically walk around it, kind of like this chihuahua here. And I want to do this for two reasons. The first is that I want to get a sense of all of the possible shots that are available to me on the table, given the current state of it. And it's important to do a physical walk around to get this idea so that I can see the table from new angles, so I can see which balls will actually go in and into which pockets. And the second reason is that I want to get a sense of how all of the balls are laid out in relationship to each other. So by walking around the table, I'm just getting another perspective than the one I had when I was in the first spot that I was standing in. In the context of software engineering, the idea behind walking around the table is to get an idea of the code base you're working in before you're diving into a rewrite. So I generally like to figure out the project dependencies, figure out what feature set we need to maintain, how is the code currently structured, and what's the context and the history behind the implementation. So when working on sign up, the code base we were working in was primarily written for the test. It was quickly written so that we could get it out the door and get an understanding of how it was performing. And also, while working on it, you can imagine that the spec and the designs for the test were changing, so we had to update the implementation as we were going. So not only is this just a lot of work to do, but there's not time for documentation. So in order to get a good idea of the existing feature set when trying to rewrite it, 
It involved a lot of diving into the old code base and trying to figure out what files were involved in other ones. And this was also a really good time for us to go to the original implementers of the test and the designers and ask why things had been done the way they did. And the reason we did this is to get a very preliminary sense of what types of things might be tested in the future. What are the types of things in sign up that we like to test and iterate on quickly? So by walking around the code base, we can figure out the project dependencies and in the process identify the problems with the implementation. Because obviously, before we can fix our problems, we need to know what they are. In software engineering, walking around the table also means getting a lay of the land of the developer community as well as your own code base. Are there tools out there that can be used to solve your problem? And if so, which one is going to be the best tool for the job? Having walked around the table in your own code base, this should be a relatively easy question to answer. So for sign up, we knew that we had to fix the way that we manage state, so we started researching Flux implementations. And we started coming up with a list of pros and cons of each one as it would apply to our problems. And I'm gonna go over which one we chose in the next step. So, after I've walked around the table, I've seen all of the possible shots that I can take, and I've also seen where they all are in relationship to each other. The next thing I do is to actually choose the shot that I'm going to take next. And this is a very strategic step, because I not only want to consider the balls that I can hit at this very particular moment, but also be forward thinking enough to know which balls I'm going to hit after that. Sometimes I like to see my way all the way to the end of the game, where I'm the one who gets the eight ball in. And this always has a lot to do with the state of the table, which is going to change from turn to turn. In an ideal world where I never miss and I make 100% of my shots, in which case I'd probably be a professional pool player instead of working for Netflix, I usually work my way backwards from the eight. So that's my goal and I wanna work my way backwards from there. So in this step, I need to come up with a run that sets me up with the long-term goal of in this case, winning the game. And a run, when I say that, I mean it's a set of balls that I want to get in in a particular order. So I need to figure out which shots are gonna set me up well to complete my run. And something here just to make note of is that sometimes the easiest shot to make currently isn't the one that you want to take because after that you might have no shots and you won't be going anywhere. So in a code rewrite, we need to do something similar in terms of finding our way out. We have an idea of what the code base looks like after we've walked around it. And here we wanna deal with the immediate problems at hand and be forward thinking enough about it so that we can get to our end goal. So like in pool, I think the best way to do that is to work backwards. It's best to figure out what the ideal state of the new code base is going to look like and figure out what you need to do to get there. Here on the left, we have kind of a cartoonish depiction of what our code base used to look like, which is with state sprinkled all around the component tree and the code base. On the right, we have the goal where the state is consolidated in one place. So knowing that the ideal goal or the ideal end state is more centralized state, we work our way backwards and decided to introduce a flux framework into the application. Having walked around the table of the developer community, we already knew that we wanted that flux framework to be Redux. And we chose this framework for a, particular re for a couple of reasons. And one of them is that it has a relatively small file size and on sign up, performance is important to us. And the second reason that it appealed to us is that Redux is very extensible. You can write custom Redux middleware for your application. And this really appealed to us because we wanted our new code base to be flexible enough for new features and A-B testing. And this is key because we don't exactly know what those A-B tests are going to look like and as they're being written, they might not fit very well into our current architecture. So this is where Redux middleware came in for us. So now that we've walked around the table, we've found our way out, we've come up with our strategy, it's time to take our shot and this is our execution step. So in pool, I have a run on the table in my mind, that's my strategy, but I also need to execute. So I need to take into account the short term and the short term changes in the code or on the table. So which shots are gonna be doable for me? How many balls are left on the table and can I really get all of the balls in in one turn? Maybe I can execute the run that I have in my mind fully, but sometimes there just isn't a good series of balls to hit to win the game at that particular moment. And so I'll break the table down into a series of smaller runs. 
I'll, maybe I'll try to get a few balls in and then I'll play a defense to leave my opponent in a bad position, which will hopefully guarantee me another turn at the table later. So while a defense is not good in the short term, in the long term goal of winning the game, it's good in the short term. So either way, it's time to hit something. He's so much better than I am at this one. <laughs> in software engineering, we also have our strategy. And so like in pool, I'm asking myself, can I win from here, or do I need to break the table up into a series of runs? In software engineering, the equivalent of taking our shot is, start, is starting to code. And when rewriting our entire code base, we want to figure out if we can do the state refactor in one fell swoop, or do we need to break it up into more digestible steps? So here, we decided to break it up into smaller efforts, and we rewrote our signup flow one page at a time. And we did this for a couple of reasons. The first is that it makes it easier for other developers to review and reason about what you're working on. It's easier for them to get an idea of where your re-architecture is going if they can digest it in smaller pieces. Secondly, it made it much easier for us to work with our QA engineers to test the sign-up flow as we went. So because we were rewriting one page or one step at a time, our QA engineers could focus on that particular area to make sure we didn't have any regressions for all of our user states that we support. So by breaking it up into smaller steps, we were able to get technical as well as functional feedback on the implementation quickly. So I've taken my shot in pool, but more often than not, I end up missing. And when I say missing, I don't just mean not getting a ball in, but I also mean that our strategy just didn't go to plan, or my strategy in this case. And in pool, there can be multiple factors that contribute to why you miss. One, there's your skill. Um, different bars will have different constraints. So, for example, the walls might be really close to the table, or the table might play a bit faster than you're used to. Either way, it's important to stand up and analyze why you missed on that particular shot, because it can inform how you find your way out or execute in the future. So, we adjust mentally, and hopefully, I get another turn at the table, and it's important then to go through each step again, because the state of the table has changed since my last turn, because of the shots that I've been taking, and also because of the shots that my opponent has been taking. And like in pool, we also have to adjust when we miss in software engineering, specifically re-architecting code. What are the ways that we miss when we do refactors, though? The most obvious is that we create bugs. And the second is that tools and frameworks that we use in our re-architectures are going to impose different constraints on the work that we're doing. But we have to learn from these mistakes and iterate. So for us, by breaking down the refactor of the signup flow into one step at a time, we could quickly learn from the mistakes, we could adjust and repeat again. And like in pool, it's important to go through each step again because the misses not only expose bugs, but they can also expose more fundamental problems with our new architecture. And so we might need to walk around the code base again, come up with a new strategy, and start coding. So we worked incrementally to allow for faster and more productive iteration. And the early feedback was really important in order to make sure that we didn't invest resources or too much time and effort going down the wrong path. And while it may have taken us a little bit longer for us, it was important because it's worth the time investment. So overall, I still think software re-architectures are pretty hard. It's hard to know where to start. There's a lot of work to do. And we need to balance fixing the current problems with supporting future work. But in my mind, and maybe in your minds now too, re-architecting code is a lot like playing pool. We need to find a way to be successful in the short term and set ourselves up for long-term success. We need to be able to address, address the problems that are in front of us and also address them in a way that anticipates work that we might do in the future. And this means blending strategy and execution. And pool provides a good mental framework on how to blend these two things as well as concrete tax tactics as to how to go through a project of this nature. For software engineering and code rewrites like in pool, we need to start by choosing our lineup and then we need to walk around the table so that we can find our way out and after which we'll take our shot and if we miss, it's okay. We just adjust and repeat. Thank you.